All right, so uh, as Rabbi Penny um, mentioned earlier, I happen to be the, uh, the co-director of a Chabad, um, Chabad house in uh, Coral Gables. And uh, it's my privilege to be a shliach of the Rebbe in Coral Gables, Florida. But some of you may not be, uh, we're not aware that in addition to being a Chabad rabbi, uh, I also wear another hat. And for tonight's presentation, I'm going to swap my rabbi hat with my Indiana Jones hat. So, so uh, tonight, I'm going to take you on a journey back 2,000 years. And I want to ask, begin by asking a question. What were U.S. Ambassador David Friedman, U.S. Ambassador to Israel David Friedman, White House Special Envoy Jason Greenblatt, and many other dignitaries doing in a subterranean tunnel in Jerusalem exactly one year ago? Answer, they were unveiling the most ambitious subterranean excavation Israel has ever undertaken, and it's called the Pilgrimage Road. Imagine being a pilgrim in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. You're walking on the main street of Jerusalem on your way up to the Temple Mount. Now fast forward 2,000 years. That same street is now being exposed and it's between 16 to 20 feet underground. It's the most ambitious and expensive excavation Israel has undertaken since its founding. You will be amazed tonight as we explore the ancient pilgrimage road and the sewer system beneath it, the drainage channel that runs underneath Jerusalem's main street. It will reveal the link between the city of David and the Temple Mount. Along the way, we will highlight dramatic new finds within the road and the channel that are reshaping our understanding of the city's ancient history. So what we're gonna do is, um, I am now going to transition to Jerusalem. We are now standing at the Kotel, well, at least virtually, and uh, I'm gonna be sharing my screen and we're gonna be doing a, a PowerPoint-based presentation so you will be able to follow along. We'll have images, diagrams, maps, and some short video clips. And I hope that when we are done tonight, you will have a newfound appreciation for ancient Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So I am now sharing my screen. And the name of this presentation is The Pilgrimage Road from Shiloh Pool to the Western Wall. Um, I want to begin by asking you, if I may, who could give me a thumbs up if you have been to Jerusalem? Give me a, a, either a real thumbs up or a virtual thumbs up. Okay, I see quite a few. I see, I see two thumbs ups from some people. That's great. Excellent. Um, now, for those of you who have been to Jerusalem, I'm asking now a follow-up question. Give me a thumbs up if you've been to the city of David. City of David, ancient Jerusalem. Okay, I see less thumbs up now than I did before. But it's nice to see that some of you have been to the city of David. But I got to tell you that those of you who have been to Jerusalem but have not been to the city of David, you are missing out. And that's because the city of David is the ancient historic core of Jerusalem. It's where Jerusalem began 
It's where it's the city that King David captured from the Jebusites 3,000 years ago. And the, what we call the old city of Jerusalem did not even exist in King David's time period. So our presentation tonight will focus on an area of subterranean city of David. So some of you have seen this photo last year. Uh, it's the opening, sorry about that, the opening of an expanded section of the pilgrimage road uh, last year, the end of June of 2019. We see here uh, Ambassador David Freeman, uh, U.S. Ambassador to Israel on the left, um, Special Envoy Jason Greenblatt on the right. They ceremoniously took a sledgehammer and they uh, opened up a reconstructed wall unveiling the newly expanded section of the pilgrimage road. This is what was unveiled. So the project of unveiling this road actually began um, over a decade ago, but it's been uh, it's an ongoing project. And last year at this time, uh, the newly open section was uh, unveiled to uh, many dignitaries. As you can see here by looking at this, um, this is a, an underground road. What's a, ground, what's a road doing underground? Well, the answer is this road used to be under the sky like any other road. But today, this road is anywhere from 16 to 20 uh, meters underground, actually 16 to 20 feet underground. And that's because uh, as the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, this road was covered up in rubble for close to 2,000 years, and it is only now being excavated 2,000 years later. Um, as you can see from this photo, this is a very ambitious and costly project. Uh, the archaeologists are teaming up with engineers who um, have experience with tunneling. And in particular, the engineers involved in this archaeological project have teamed up with uh, tunnelers from uh, Switzerland, being that the, the Alps has many tunnels for their road system. So Swiss engineers have been uh, assisting the Israeli archaeologists and engineers with building this um, metal, as you can see, this metalwork uh, tunnel system that would support the, the uh, city above, because there are about 20,000 people that live above the ground. So let's go get right into it. Jerusalem's step street and drainage channel, which is a link between the city of David and the Temple Mount. So as you can see here in this map, uh, here we have the outline of the old city of Jerusalem. This is roughly, this is the old city walls of Jerusalem. Here is the Temple Mount. This area to the south of the Temple Mount is known as the City of David. As I mentioned earlier, that's the ancient historic core of Jerusalem. And the red line right here indicates where the uh, Jerusalem's main street used to be. It went from the southern end of southern tip of a city and went right along up the step street uh, and then it continued along the base of the western wall. So actually where we stand today at the Kotel Plaza, if you dig deep enough you will get to the original main street of Jerusalem which goes along the base of the western wall. And if some of you have been to the Kotel Tunnel Tours, you've seen that some of that main street has been exposed. So this is a the road superimposed on the modern landscape. And you can see here at the at southern end of this road, there was a grand pool, which was like a spa built by King Herod um, towards the end of the second temple period when Herod was uh, involved in all of his building projects, reshaping the Jerusalem landscape. And you can see that from this large pool, which has been partially uncovered in recent years at the southern end of the city of David, there was a, a road, a step street that went as the topography goes uphill here. So the, the street was a step street and it went all the way along, uh, it went alongside what's now known as the city of David until it reaches the base of the Western Wall. 
So it's for the first time we have a link between the city of David and the Temple Mount. Here is another view. This is from a reconstru virtual reconstruction reconstru by the uh, visual simulation team at the UCLA, where again, this, is, this view is from the south, and you can see here the step road, and it continues up until it reaches the, this is the Temple Mount. And these are the, the walls surrounding the Temple Mount. This is the Southern Wall. These, are, these were the main entrances onto the Temple Mount. It's called the Double Gate. And this was the road that pilgrims who would visit Jerusalem, particularly during the three major festivals of Passover, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, they would, um, according to scholars, they would immerse themselves in that Shiloach pool, um, and they would continue up to the, um, on, the on, on this road over here until they reached the Temple Mount. So this was like the last uh, 600 meters of the pilgrimage uh, of, of the pilgrims. Now, this is a reconstruction of, a, of the pilgrimage road. As you can see, this is a road that was under the sky. It was about 25 feet wide in its heyday, and it was lined with two-story buildings, shops, lining. This was the main street of Jerusalem. You can see people bringing their offerings, bringing their, um, their, their animals for offerings, or whether they're bringing their fruits for Bikurim, the first fruits, and they're going up with the throngs of people on their way up to the Temple Mount. As you can see at the end of this road, you can see a little part of what's now known as Robin, Robinson's Arch, which supported a monumental staircase. So let's take a look at the road um, and the channel beneath it that was discovered recently. And this is what it looks like today. As you can see, this is a small section of the road that has been uncovered. And be beneath it, you can see where the drainage channel used to be, which was the ancient sewer system of Jerusalem, where the rain uh, runoff would be going into the, like any other street today, you have a, um, you have a, uh, you know, you have, you have a, like a sort of like a, uh, a, a grate where, where the sewer, the, 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 run, the runoff goes on the side of the street. Similar, they had these um, same thing made of stone on Jerusalem's main street. This is what an artist's reconstruction of the road above and the drainage channel below. Here's a closer up. You can see the people walking up the main street of Jerusalem. And here below it is the ancient drainage channel, the ancient sewer system of Jerusalem that was exposed. Let's watch this short video clip about the connection between the Shiloa pool and the step street known as the pilgrimage road. Here I am at the archaeological site of the Siloam Pool, discovered by archaeologists in 2004. Mentioned in the Bible, the Siloam Pool was the major water drawing source of ancient Jerusalem. These, in fact, are the stairs that brought Jewish pilgrims down into the pool to purify before they began the dramatic ascent up to the Temple Mount. Archaeologists, however, ask themselves a question. If this was the pool, how did those pilgrims actually walk up to the Temple and the Western Wall? That brings us to our next and perhaps most exciting discovery. This is the ancient pilgrimage thoroughfare, and these are the very stairs that are being excavated that once carried millions of Jews from the Siloam Pool up to the Temple Mount 2,000 years ago. Okay, let's look at some of the characteristics of this pilgrim pilgrimage road on the drainage channel. So as you can see here, this is uh, the initial section of street that was uncovered near the Shiloh Pool in the southern end of the city of David. And originally, as I mentioned before, 25 feet wide. And it has a very unique pattern, these steps. It's not a typical pattern of stairs that we have today. But as you notice, there are two steps and a landing, two steps and a landing, and so it goes. And archaeologists have matched this. They've compared this to the grand staircase leading up to the, the Temple Mount, which had a similar pattern. And they believe the reason for this unique pattern, not your typical stairs like we have today, is because when you ascend to, towards the Temple Mount, your ascent should be very deliberate. Using modern day lingo, you shouldn't be texting on your phone as you, be, as you walk up the stairs because you will stumble. So you have to be very um, 
deliberate and focused as you walk up these stairs. 600 meters of the street until you reach the Temple Mount. The entire length of the street was about one kilometer. Now the drainage channel, which is underneath the street, is about between a third to a meter wide. It's about a, a one to three meters high. And depending on where you are, anywhere from 15 to 20 meters underground. And as they excavated this, uh, these two, the street and the drainage channel below, they, they, what they use what's called a horizontal archaeology. So as you may be aware, archaeologists typically remove layer upon layer. It's called vertical archaeology. They remove the top layer like a sandwich. Each layer tells us about a different period of time. So they remove the top layer, then the layer under, underneath that. So then you have, let's say, going back, first temple era, second temple era, uh, Roman era, Byzantine era, and so on. Um, but when it came to this, because, they, because we're exposing a street that's underground, and you can't start from the top down, that's because there are homes that are built above the ground. So they have to build, they have to dig horizontally. And some people have been criticizing uh, Israel for doing, carrying out such an excavation. But nevertheless, this is a very important one. So as you can see, they uh, use a unique system here to remove the earth from where they're exposing this drainage channel. They put them into bags. Every bag is marked from the location where it, it originated from. And it's moved along this uh, system here to the front entrance so that these bags can then be sent to the Temple Mount sifting project in order that they can sift through this earth uh, using a wet sifting process to see if there's anything of uh, value within this earth. And as you can see here within the um, step street, they use a similar system, a little more elaborate using buckets um, on this uh, system over here. And uh, these buckets are moved along. So all the earth all the way at the, uh, where the point where they're beginning to dig, as they're continuing to dig out the tunnel, they fill up these buckets of earth again, to bring, move it to the uh, end of, the, of this tunnel. And then in each, each bucket is marked from exactly where it came from and it's sent to the sifting project. So let's a little bit about the history of a drainage channel. This is a diagram of the Temple Mount uh, with all of the earth stripped away. So what's interesting is this is color coded. And if you see here, the yellow code, the yellow wall here was the original Temple Mount Square that was the dimensions of a Temple Mount when King Solomon built the, built the first temple. It was the same dimensions when Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt the temple, uh, when they built the second temple. But this color-coded orange wall was an extension that was built by the Hashmonaim, the Hasmoneans, and the green wall is the extension of a Temple Mount which was built by Herod towards the end of the second temple period, which was by far the largest extension. The reason why I'm pointing this out to you is because keep in mind the, this color-coded system of the expansion and the development of a temple mount will be, uh, we'll see in our, in our next slide right here. So you see the original temple mount square color-coded here in yellow. Um, there was an early drainage system that uh, was the sewer system of ancient Jerusalem that went alongside the valley of the Temple Mount underground. But what happens is that when the Hasmoneans expanded their Temple Mount, it cut right into the original drainage channel. So they had to build a bypass. So they built a new drainage channel, which would, which would bypass their extension. Now, when Herod built an extension for his Temple Mount, it cut right into the Hasmoneans drainage channel. So he had to build a bypass to that, uh, to the drainage channel, which is what exists today. And you can see this different construction. The Hasmonean uh, drainage channel is uh, flat top. The Herodian uh, construction is vaulted, which is round on the top, which is a little more elaborate as Herod was known to be a great builder. And the way it worked was that if you went down this drainage channel, uh, the, the stones above your head were actually the paving stones of Jerusalem's main street above your head. And um, this was not meant for public, um, for the public consumption, 
only maintenance crew people would be, be able to go through this uh, drainage channel to do some maintenance. As you move along the route of the, 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 uh, the Step Street or the Pilgrimage Road, we come across a fascinating discovery. We see over here the broken step. And as you can see here, this is the same broken step, but it's been covered up by the archaeologists with wood so that nobody falls into this hole. What exactly does this broken step represent? As it turns out, uh, we look in the book of Josephus and we find that this is a very um, important part of Jewish history dating back to the Second Temple period. As we know, we are coming now. Uh, recently, we commemorated the ninth day of Av, Tisha B'Av, which is the, um, the, most, the saddest day in the Jewish calendar when we commemorate the destruction of both the first and second temple. The second temple was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 of the Common Era, and the Romans laid siege to Jerusalem, so there was no one that was able to go in or out. And eventually, some people realized that there was a way out. And the way out was to go into Jerusalem's sewer system. And this is reminiscent of, uh, in more recent uh, times, when Jews were hiding from the Nazis in the, um, in the uh, Warsaw Ghetto. At some point, the, 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 the fighters of the Warsaw Ghetto hid in, in, the, Warsaw, in the Warsaw sewer system, um, of hoping to evade the Nazis. Unfortunately, we know what happened. They were flushed out by the Nazis. A similar thing happened to Jews. According to Josephus, there were 2,000 Jews that hid in Jerusalem's sewer system, hiding from the Romans. Some of them may have even managed to escape. It is believed that the rebels who made it to Masada, which was the last final stand against the Romans, and they were not subdued until three years after the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, made it out through the sewer system. They managed to get out. Well, we find the following. It, within the drainage channel, there, were, um, in, there was an incredible find that is not found anywhere in archaeology in Israel, or for that matter, anywhere else. And that is they found um, cookware or vessels that were completely intact. Never do you find intact um, items, artifacts in uh, an archaeological find. But here we found cookware. What exactly does this represent? Well, as we mentioned before in the book of Josephus, it says that Jews were actually hiding out in this tunnel, in this sewer system, and they actually cooked food. And here we see the cookware. And we also find lamps, oil lamps that were used to light up uh, the tunnels so they could live there. They actually managed to live in the sewer system for a, a certain period of time until someone um, alerted the Romans that there were Jews hiding in the sewer system. And that's when the Romans broke up the step. As we see here, the account of Josephus, the Romans, the Romans killed some of them. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna mute everyone. The Romans killed some of them. Some of them they carried away as captives and others they made a search for underground. And when they found where they were, they broke up the ground and killed all they'd met with. That's an account from Josephus, the Jewish historian. Just to go back and you can see uh, the point where they broke up the ground right here, the broken step. This became the famous broken step. There's also another point further up the, 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 the pilgrimage road where we can see a very clear broken step where the Romans broke in and uh, discovered the Jews who were hiding out. So here's another interesting find. As you move along the step street, the, the pilgrimage road, there was a stone podium found alongside the road. And at first, the, the archaeologists thought that they found the stairs to some structure that was alongside the, the main street. But as it turns out, it was the stairs to nowhere. The stairs didn't lead to anywhere. It just led to the top of a, a podium. Well, an interesting idea came to the archaeologists, and they thought, perhaps is this the famous Stone of Claims 
mentioned in the Talmud. As we know in Hebrew, it's called Evan Hatayim, which is a, a place where people made announcements. As this was the main street of Jerusalem, there were throngs of pilgrims, thousands of people that passed through this road. And if you wanted to make an announcement, let's say if someone lost an object and you wanted to announce that you lost, you found an object, you would go up on this road. This, this was like the, the Hyde Park corner of Jerusalem's, uh, along Jerusalem's main street. And we can see right here, the claimant stone in the Talmud from Baba Metziah, it says, there was a claimant stone in Jerusalem. Anyone who lost an item would be directed there. Anyone who found a lost item would be directed there. This finder would stand and proclaim his fine and that owner would stand and provide its distinguishing marks and take the item. Perhaps we have uncovered the claimant stone mentioned in the Talmud. Now here's, uh, as you move further down the drainage channel, once you get literally to the Western wall, you come across this large stone. Now this large stone, uh, uh, according to scholars, fell into, fell into the arch, which, um, fell into the arch, I'm sorry, fell into the drainage channel, possibly from an archway that went right above this area section of the drainage channel, or possibly from the Western Wall itself. But because the stone was so large, the builders did not bother removing the stone and they just left it intact in the drainage channel. So this was the supporting arch. This is the Western Wall of uh, Jerusalem. So today of the Temple Mount, uh, when we when we talk about the when we when we're at the prayer plaza of the Western Wall, we're roughly in this section of the Western Wall. It's exposed, and also this is the area south. This is the southwestern corner. This is the south corner. This is this is the south. This is the west. Right above your head here used to be a a, a huge arch, which is the largest arch in its day when it was built by the builders of the Temple Mount uh, plant, uh, walls. And it supported a monumental staircase leading in, in one of the gate entranceways into the Temple Mount. And um, it's possible that one of these stones, as they were building this arch, fell down and, and got lodged into the, um, into the drainage channel, which went right below Jerusalem's main street. This is the same street, but over here it's not a step street because it's no longer going uphill. Um, it's going very slightly uphill, but it's not like uh, the topography changes. This is the Robinson's Arch area today. So you can see this is, what we have today is only the spring and the base of the arch, but what used to be this large arch has been destroyed by the Romans. Here we can see um, uh, a British engineer and captain by the name of Charles Warren. Uh, he discovered this, uh, the, he was the first one that discovered the drainage channel. And he actually descended into the drainage channel using this rope ladder, which was a very, um, difficult way of descending. This is his assistant and he had, there were no photographs back then. This is back in the 1860s. So he had an artist that would document his uh, discoveries underground Jerusalem. So you can see this is what this, the, the stone uh, looks like today. Uh, we, we do not uh, continue. The drainage channel is the last point along the, uh, the, the, our journey down the drainage channel. This is Warren's excavations and this is how his assistant is looking at that stone. When you uh, conclude your journey through the drainage channel today, because as you go through the uh, step road, most of it is still an active excavation and, it's, and we, you cannot continue down the steps read it, probably take at least another five years until they fully excavated to, until the Western wall. So a visitor today would have to follow the drainage channel. You have to descend into the drainage channel and that's, that will be your way to get all the way to the Western Wall. You see here, they uh, opened up the, this is the original main street of Jerusalem along the base of the Western Wall, right underneath uh, Robinson's Arch. They put this fence up and you come up these stairs. As you can see a guy here, descend, uh, ascending these, the flight of stairs, coming out of the drainage channel. Um, and here you can see the base of the uh, Robinson's Arch above. As you continue along the um, drainage channel, and you, as you get to the, the base of the Western Wall, you can actually see these are actual stones of the Western Wall, but because they were not meant for public consumption, as they were below ground level, they are rough, rough stones, which is not typical. Usually uh, Herodian 
stones which of, of which the t Western Wall was made of, and for that matter, the rest of the uh, walls around the, the Temple Mount were very uh, smooth face, very, um, they were smooth uh, front. But over here, they are rough because they were not meant for public consumption. You can see here was actually the stones of the Western Wall were placed right down onto the bedrock. So what was found along the uh, drainage channel and the uh, step street is some fascinating discoveries that I made. I'm gonna share them with you now. The first thing that was found was this silver shekel. It's called a Tyrian silver shekel. Uh, it was actually Greek and uh, it was struck in the year 22 of the common era, weighs 13 grams. Only seven of these have been found in Jerusalem, seven of either shekels or half shekels that were found in Jerusalem. This one is a full shekel, not a half shekel, but at some point in time, there were no half shekels available in, in Jerusalem. They were not struck until the rebels of uh, Jerusalem in the year 66 began to, to, make, to mint their own half shekels. So if you had to bring the half shekel tax, which is mandatory, ma mandated by the Bible, you had to perhaps share a, a one shekel with someone else. As long as you participated in the half shekel, which was a weight of approximately seven grams of silver. This is a stone sketch of a menorah that was found inside the drainage channel that probably someone sketched in the times of a second temple, threw it into the, the gutter and it fell into the drainage system. And perhaps this guy saw the menorah, obviously it's not an accurate depiction of the menorah, but you, know, you can only see it only has, uh, it only has five branches here, which is not accurate. The, the menorah had seven branches, but it's just an idea. This is one of the, um, this is a menorah that was found dating back to the times of a second temple from someone that possibly has seen a menorah on the Temple Mount. Interestingly, a Roman legionnaire's sword still in its leather sheath was found on the eve of Tisha B'Av. This is evidence that Roman soldiers were inside the drainage channel as they were clearing out the Jews who were hiding inside the drainage channel. Uh, clear evidence, and it's interesting that Josephus describes that the lead, one of the Jewish rebel leaders, a man by the name of Shimon bar Giura, uh, mentioned in his books as one of the leaders of the, of the rebels, was found inside the drainage channel, who was hiding out from the Romans. But the Romans caught him, and they, ca they captured him. They brought him to Rome, and they paraded him around together with other Jews who were captured by the Romans. This is a Roman gladius sword. So you can see what the sword, if it would have been in new condition, you see the Roman uh, gladiators had this type of sword. This is standard um, type of swords that the Romans from the uh, soldiers had. And what we found earlier, you can see it's really worn out over time, but it's, it's the, it was originally metal and just been oxidized and it's still in its leather sheath. This is what I'm gonna show you now is one of the most interesting discoveries that were made in the drainage channel. And that's the golden bell. It has become very famous. And it looks like this. It's a very unique golden bell in a very unique shape in pretty good condition. And it has a loop above. Now what's the, why would it have a loop above? And archeologists believe that this bell was actually tied to something, to some garment. And who exactly had bells tied to their garment? Well, um, if we look in the, in the Bible, we can see that it's, this, is this is possibly from the high priest, the Kohen Gadol. As the Bible tells us that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, on, the, on, the bot on its bottom hem, you shall make pomegranates of blue, purple, and crimson wool, on its bottom hem all around, and golden bells, in their midst all around. So we know that the Kohen Gadol had bells, as you can see here, the Kohen Gadol's clothing on the bottom of his, uh, one of his uh, garments, he had a uh, pomegranate bell, pomegranate bell, in total 72 bells and 72 pomegranates, which were um, adorned the bottom. So it actually made a noise 
as the Kohen Gadol would walk. And it's very likely that the Kohen Gadol was walking down the main street of Jerusalem. One of his bells on the bottom of, of his coat, of his, uh, of his garment, fell off the garment and rolled into the gutter, in, down into the drainage channel. It's been, been there for 2,000 years, and it was discovered re in recent years within the drainage channel. And interestingly, somebody actually who is a professor of audiology took the, the bell actually works. You can shake it. There's a little clapper inside and it makes a noise. And uh, someone took that sound, multiplied it by 72 in a computer to give uh, a possible sound of what it would have sounded like when the Kohen Gadol would have been walking down the streets of Jerusalem. The Golden Bell actually became so popular that the city of David actually made replicas and they offered it today for jewelry and it cost over a thousand dollars if you'd like to buy it. If, it's, if, you too, if the price tag is too expensive, they have a gold plated option uh, for $159. This is one of the most interesting finds that was found in the drainage channel and it's an actual uh, link, a very concrete link to activity on top of the Temple Mount that, uh, you know, we know the Temple Mount was, a, um, we know the, the, the Temple was on the Temple Mount, but there, there are no archeological remains of the actual Temple that have been uncovered. And, and that's mostly to, due to the fact that uh, the Waqaf who controls the Temple Mount does not give any permission to uh, excavate on the Temple Mount. And perhaps it's been completely destroyed, but nevertheless, we do have this item, which gives us an indication of temple activity. And we can see here, written in Aramaic, are the Aramaic words that say, Daka Leka, which means pure for God. It was a token. You can see it here, the Hebrew, it, was, it has the Hebrew letters, Dalit, Kaf, Aleph, and then Lamed, Yur, and then Hey, uh, which means pure for God. Daka means pure in Aramaic. This was a temp, uh, I'm going to show you soon a uh, quote from the Mishnah indicating what exactly this token was used for. Uh, another alternative reading to this is Dakar Aleph Liyahayarid, which indicates Dakar means a ram in Aramaic. Aleph is the day of the week, which is Sunday. And Liyahayarid, which is the name of the priestly family that was in charge of the Temple Mount service during the, it was their shift. So what does it say in the Mishnah, something fascinating, it says that there was a voucher certifying ritual purity. Let's read what it says. It says, whoever required libations, meaning anyone that required to bring an offering on the Temple Mount, would go to Yochanan, who was in charge of the stamps, give him the appropriate amount of money, and we would receive a stamp from him in return. He would then go to Achia, who was in charge over the libations, which is the, the, uh, uh, the, the offerings, give him the stamp and receive the libations from him. So we see that there was like a voucher that when you went to the Temple Mount and you wanted to bring an offering, you, you, you would first have to certify that you were pure. So you would go to the, this uh, Yochanan, who was in charge of the stamps, stamps is this voucher, and when, when you would certify that you were pure, you would pay him, he would give you a voucher, you would then take this voucher, which was this seal that was found that says pure for God or, or the alternative reading of it. And you would present it to another person. In this case, his name was Achia. And he would give you the appropriate type of offering that you would need for uh, the temple service. Fascinating that we found an actual voucher or a temple token that indicates temple activity and it was found very close to the Temple Mount, underneath the, uh, near, alongside the Western Wall in the drainage channel. This is what it looks like. This is the bottom of it on one side, the top of it on the other side. Here's another fascinating find that was found. It's called a, as we know, um, in the first temple period, as I mentioned earlier, everyone had to bring uh, a half shekel flat tax once a year for the upkeep of the, of the temple. Uh, this was ever since uh, the Bible, uh, Moses gave this instruction to the Jewish people, every year Jews had to give a flat tax, regardless of your socioeconomic uh, status, 
everyone had to give the same exact amount, one half shekel. Now a half shekel is a weight. What happens when you don't have a half shekel coin that weighs the amount of a half shekel? So what you do is they had this. They, un they found a Becca weight, which is a stone weight, and it actually says Becca on it in ancient Hebrew, Bez Kuf Ayin. Um, and a Becca is the, the exact weight of a half shekel, which is roughly about seven grams. So when, you didn't ha when, we, when, when a half shekel coin didn't exist, uh, you would bring silver chips and you would place it on a scale and place the Becca weight on one side and place the silver chips on the other side until it balances out so you know exactly how much silver uh, would be brought for the uh, half shekel. As we see straight from the Bible, the half shekel tax, one becca per head, that is a half shekel according to the holy shekel, for each one who goes through the counting from 20 years old and upwards, at that time the Jews were 603,550 people, everyone had to bring a half shekel, and a half shekel weighs one becca. We now have that weight that was found very close to the Temple Mount in the drainage channel. Again, it must have fell out in someone's pocket, rolled into the drainage channel. This is a, another fascinating discovery that was made in the Step Street, the Pilgrimage Road. It's, it's a very unique find. It's a stone tabletop used to measure liquid volumes. So this belonged to the manager of the ancient Jerusalem marketplace. It is one area roughly in the middle of the, uh, the step street that there was a, the pilgrimage road, which is a wider flat area. It was believed that that was the ancient marketplace of Jerusalem. And <clears throat> they found this stone tabletop, which has a cavity in it, which was used to measure liquid volumes. As you can see on the bottom of this, there was a hole. So how, how did one know, for example, if they wanted to sell um, oil or wine or any other liquids to someone else in the marketplace, how would they know they had, they had an accurate measurement of liquid? What they would do is they would bring their liquid, let's assume it was wine, to the guy in charge of the manager of the marketplace, and they would pour it into this cavity. And before they would pour into this cavity, they would plug the bottom hole either with his finger or with some other method, until it was filled to the top. And this was a, a perfect, um, an accurate uh, amount of a certain type of volume. Let's say it could have been, let's say a log, which was uh, an ancient um, measuring for, for liquid volume, or let's say in today's, in today's language, it could be either a gallon, a liter. And you can see there was another amount of volume that was uh, near this cavity, but it's been broken off. And then we knew exactly the, when you know the exact amount of volume, you can then uh, uh, take your jug and release the volume into your jug, and you would know the exact amount uh, that was necessary. So this belonged to the Jerusalem Central Market Manager. It was found alongside dozens of stone measurement weights. So we know that this was the area of Jerusalem's ancient marketplace. Uh, we find the pilgrimage road in the Mishnah, a very interesting um, a very interesting uh, argument takes place between the famous scholars, sages of the Mishnah, Hillel and Shammai, and they ask, who is a minor? When it comes to uh, making the pilgrimage, which was a mandatory, which was mandatory for Jews to go up uh, during the major uh, uh, festivals of Passover, Sukkot, and Shavuot and Sukkot, it says that a minor is exempt from uh, making the pilgrimage. The question is, what is considered a minor uh, when it comes to making a pilgrimage? So we have a disagreement between Hill and Shammai. Sham, who is a minor? Whoever is unable to ride on his father's shoulders and go up from Jerusalem to the Temple Mount, the words of Bet Shammai. So if you are unable to go on your father's shoulder up to the, to the Temple Mount, then you're considered a minor. You don't have to make the pilgrimage. But Bet Hillel says, Whoever is unable to hold his father's hand and go up from Jerusalem to the Temple Mount, as it says, three regalim, which is a term used for the festivals, regalim actually means feet. And the, because the Torah uses regalim feet 
for festivals, we learn, says, says Hillel, that if you can walk up from the bottom of Jerusalem to, towards the Temple Mount, you are consi not considered a minor anymore when it comes to pilgrimage. And that's this pilgrimage road. Uh, the pilgrimage road is, was an indication. If you could walk up that pilgrimage road, which is about 600 meters, you were considered no longer a minor and you were obligated to make the pilgrimage up to the Temple Mount during the three major festivals. We're gonna conclude now with a, uh, a video that was produced by the city of David about the pilgrimage road in Jerusalem. Uh, shortly after the opening uh, one year ago of the pilgrimage road. So sit back and relax and enjoy. <music> ידענו שיש פה את הרחוב, אבל לא ידענו איפה בדיוק הוא מתחיל. ואני הייתי בצוות שחשף את המדרגות ממש בפעם הראשונה, ואז ידענו שזה המקום. אני בעצם עושה פה את הסימון הראשוני, ומפה זה יוצא על מסוע של 200 מטר לפני האדמה, שם זה עובר סימון יותר מעמיק של מטבעות, טבעות, חרוזים, חותמות. על כל שק שיוצא מהחפירה אנחנו רושמים מספר של השכבה שחפרנו ואת העריך שחפרנו אותו ואנחנו שולחים לפינות. For the past six years, we've been working on excavating intensively the main street, the Pilgrim Street, which led from the Silwan Pool up to the Temple Mount, about 600 meters long, eight meters wide, and would have housed the thousands of pilgrims which arrived in Jerusalem from surrounding areas in order to take part in the ceremonies on the temple. In 70 CE, Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans who burn it, as Josephus says, all the way down to Silwam. And we've been exposing that destruction layer, which included the food and the coins and the glass vessels and the pottery vessels, which smashed onto the street and then were covered over by the buildings that collapsed and sealed that destruction layer, which waited 2,000 years for us to come and excavate it. הרבה שנים חלמנו להגיע לירושלים. היום אני עובד כשש שנים. אני ראש צוות, ובשבילי זה הגשמת חלום. אני שמח לעבוד פה. במהלך החפירה אנחנו נתקלנו באבן שפה או אבן משקוף. אבן מאוד מאוד כבדה, שוקלת כחצי טון. ואנחנו פשוט חייבים להוציא אותה על מנת להמשיך בחפירה. מעלינו נמצאים בתים, רחובות ועיר שוקקת. אנחנו מצד אחד רוצים לחשוף את העבר, ומצד שני אנחנו רוצים לשמר את מה שקיים. על מנת לאפשר את זה אנחנו מבצעים תימוך מקדים על ידי מטריות, ולאחר מכן אנחנו שמים קשתות ומסגרות לתימוך הסופי. אנחנו בזמן החישובים לקחנו את העומסים שקיימים מעל הקרקע, את העומסים שקיימים בתוך הקרקע, ולאחר מכן אנחנו בודקים את היציבות של המבנים לאחר שהפועלים פה סיימו את העבודה, מחשבים ומאשרים את היציבות ומאפשרים את החפירה. לפעמים אנחנו מעכבים בעצם את החפירה, אבל אנחנו לא מוכנים להתחשב על יציבות המבנה ועל בטיחות העובדים. את התכנון אנחנו עושים בשיתוף עם חברה בינלאומית בשם פיני סוויס, שמתמחה במינור. אנחנו עומדים בסטנדרטים הגבוהים ביותר בתקנים של היורו-קוד ובתקן הישראלי. עד עכשיו מצאתי 96 מטבעות, מחכה למטבע המאה. מצאנו פה ממש נר שלם, כל העיטורים, בשפה הארכיאולוגית נר תמים. זה היה מרגש. I'm standing on the pilgrimage road. 
These are the actual stairs that were uncovered here that thousands of years ago, pilgrims walked up as they made their way through Jerusalem. This is one of only a handful of sites in the entire world that has such importance to billions of people. It's incredible if we think about that Rome has the Colosseum, Egypt has the pyramids, and now Jerusalem has the pilgrimage road. Millions of people walked here in the past, and millions of people will walk here again in the future as they experience their history with their eyes, with their feet, and most importantly, with their hearts. Okay, so uh, just wanted to point out, uh, Rabbi Pini invited me to give a presentation tonight of Subterranean Jerusalem. Um, I have actually a, a number of other presentations that I offer. Uh, here you can see some of them, the archeological claim to Jerusalem, underground secrets of a temple mount, the city of David, holy trash, Hezekiah's tunnel, and there are others as well. Rabbi Stolik, thank you so much. Very fascinating. We use that word a lot tonight, but it truly was. I loved watching all the things that they found, and hopefully they can find many, many more things. And I'm hoping we can finally get into the Holy Temple, you know, underground and uncover the holy artifacts from there. And God willing, we shouldn't need the permission from the Wak for whatever it's, however they pronounce it. God willing, Hashem should send Mashiach. And it could be there in full form, not uh, a 2,000-year relic, but it should be fresh and shiny. Hopefully the holy menorah and, and everything else that should be on display for us to march to on that pilgrimage road with the coming of Mashiach.